Hammered out by Turkey and Brazil, Iran's nuclear deal has been met with global skepticism. So is Tehran sincere about its commitments and will it escape further sanctions? This is Inside Story. Hello there, welcome to the program. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Well, Iran has signed a deal agreeing to a nuclear fuel swap, a deal that will require Tehran to send a portion of its uranium abroad in exchange for 20% enriched nuclear fuel. The agreement, brokered by Turkey and Brazil, has been met with mixed reactions. While China welcomed the deal, others, including the US and France, expressed serious reservations. The United States continues to have uh, you know, concerns about the, uh, uh, the arrangement, uh, the joint declaration does not address the core concerns of the international community. Iran may, remains in defiance of five UN Security Council resolutions, including its unwillingness to suspend enrichment operations. We have some good reasons to, uh, to, um, to, to doubt, to be afraid, to be concerned, and we are expecting yet some credible answers from the Iranian side. So what does Iran gain from this? Let me introduce today's guests in Tehran, Sadek Zibakalam, a political commentator and professor at Tehran University. In Istanbul, retired army general and political analyst Haldun Sulmasturk. And in Washington, D.C., Patrick Clawson, Deputy Director for Research at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, Sadek, let me start with you in Tehran. Is Iran sincere about this deal? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, Iran is quite sincere about the offer because uh, about a year ago, uh, Mr. Al-Baradei, the ex-Atomic uh, Agency director, brought this exact proposal uh, to Tehran. But uh, for reasons that uh, I will not come into it, Iran rejected uh, the proposal. Uh, but this time, a year after uh, the, its, its, its initial uh, rejection, Iran is uh, very firm, Iran is very determined, Iran is very serious uh, about accepting uh, the so-called the swap deal. Well, you, you talk about that previous deal. I mean, that is one of the things that's raising concerns, that Iran has agreed to a deal before, an accord made last October, and that fell apart when Iran backtracked. I don't think uh, that is uh, Lucy, uh, the, the, surely, sorry, the, the, the whole story. Iran, in principle, never accepted the swap. Iran talked about it, Iran maneuvered about it, Iran veered about it, but Iran never accepted it concretely and in principle. And that's exactly what Iran announced yesterday, that we are prepared to uh, to go through uh, uh, the swap as it has been presented by uh, uh, by uh, by uh, by uh, um, Sir Al Baradei uh, last year. Now, obviously, we have to wait for the detail, but it is very important uh, for the United States uh, not to make excuses and uh, not to make political backtracking because Iran is very sincere about its intention. Okay, well, let's, let's bring the U.S. into this. Uh, Patrick, Washington has uh, said that it, it still has serious concerns uh, about Iran's nuclear program. Um, but this deal, as I understand it, shifts a, a large bulk of uh, Iran's enriched, low-enriched uranium off its soil. Isn't that what the U.S. wanted? That was always seen as a confidence-building measure while we have then some more time to deal with the basic issues, which are those raised by the five Security Council resolutions. This is about the Security Council and the international community's insistence that Iran has to restore confidence in the purely peaceful intentions of its nuclear program. And so the core issue has always been Iran addressing the concerns of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And this deal about the Tehran research reactor was a confidence-building measure in order to make progress on the underlying dispute. Let's hope that this deal does represent a, a step towards dealing with the underlying dispute. But, but that's but not how Washington is seeing it, is it? I mean, the, the, the words coming out of Washington from, from the White House and the State Department seem to be pouring a, a bit of cold water on, on, on Iran's intentions here. 
Well, that's because this trilateral agreement emphasizes that it will only come into effect when there is a, what they call a proper and written agreement with the Vienna Group, which is the United States, Russia, France, and the International Atomic Energy Agency. And already we're hearing a lot of voices in Iran of what they will insist on in that agreement with the Vienna Group, which are, are frankly, uh, go well beyond uh, what we see in the trilateral agreement. So several members of the Iranian parliament have been saying we can't sign an agreement with the Vienna Group unless all sanctions on Iran are lifted. Well, if that's the position Iran's going to take in the discussions with the Vienna Group, uh, then that's, this is agreement yesterday isn't going to represent very much. So Iran has a history of making a big noise about reaching an agreement and then not actually following through. And this agreement emphasizes that it only comes into effect once there is a written and proper arrangement with the Vienna Group. Hmm. And in fact, uh, we were just hearing that uh, major world powers have agreed on a set of draft uh, sanctions, a draft sanctions resolution against Iran, and they're going to circulate it to the UN Security Council uh, on Tuesday. Uh, Haldun, uh, what will Turkey make of that, given that it was so uh, involved in brokering this deal with Iran? Yes. Uh uh, my my dear, co dear colleague in Tehran is talking about Iran's sincerity, but I'm just I'm just talking based on what I am reading from the from the declaration. What declaration is setting for is a, is quite a long process. There will be a notification that will be followed by a kind of positive response uh, from so-called Vienna Group, uh, followed by negotiations, agreement, proper arrangements. Uh, further you know, commitment and then bilateral commitment between Iran and Vienna, uh, Vienna Group. And then if everything goes, goes fine and then this agreement will be, will be implemented. So we are looking at a long list of wishful, wishful thinking, wishful, wishful steps. And what's, uh, what's clear, what's obvious here, I Iran is uh, is maintaining the control of each each step so I don't see any indication of sincerity in that I mean I don't mean Iran is is insincere not at all but uh, I, I'm just simply saying that you know I, I cannot read read the indications regarding Turkey I'm I'm a bit confused by Turkey's involvement in this uh, in this in this affair and especially uh, statements by Turkish foreign minister and, and Turkish uh, prime minister you know, regarding, you know, uh, based on this declaration that there will not be any, any need to, to, to continue, you know, uh, for further, further sanctions. Yeah. I mean, I cannot see any connection between the sanctions process and this, de and this, and this declaration. Yeah, let's, let's have a closer look at the terms of the deal which has been signed by Iran. Uh, Iran has agreed to ship 1,200 kilograms of its stockpiled low enriched uranium to Turkey. Turkey will store the material, though it will still belong to Iran. In exchange, Iran will get 120 kilograms of nuclear fuel within a year. This will be delivered by the Vienna Group, the US, Russia, France and the IAEA. Iran says this will be used in a research reactor for its medical facilities. If Iran doesn't get the fuel as agreed, it can get its low enriched uranium back from Turkey swiftly and unconditionally. Uh, Sadek, how significant is the removal of this 1,200 kilograms of material? Uh, because some estimates are saying that it's only, it's only half the amount of low enriched uranium that, that Iran has. Uh, surely, uh, let, me, let me take uh, a couple of points, first of all, that uh, uh, Patrick uh, the, the American uh, gentleman in, in Washington, and also holding the, 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 the Turkish gentleman uh, the, made. You see, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I have a feeling, uh, I, I hope to God that I prove to be wrong, that I have a feeling that each time that Iran has sincerely has put a step forward in all fairness and in all decency, and has tried to show willingness to solve the nuclear issue. We have seen buts and if 
and nuts and this and that but from the United States. If I can, if I can from, interrupt, from the, the, the central problem is not this nuclear swap thing. The central problem is the fear of what are the intentions of Iran's nuclear program. And the point is the continuing enrichment of uranium, which Iran has, by the way, said it's not going to stop despite this deal. That's the problem. Well, first of all, surely, uh, in the original proposal which uh, Mr. Arbrade brought in Tehran with himself and 5 plus 1 backed the, the, the proposal, there was no question, there was no mention of Iran halting its enrichment. The deal was the deal was concerned over Iran handing over its uh, low enriched uranium to 5 plus 1 or, or whoever 5 plus 1 uh, appointed as, as the go-between. It happened that Russia or France uh, was, was, was elected as a country that will actually uh, make, the, um, make the swap. In the original deal, there was no mention that Iran should hold its other uh, uh, the, the nuclear activity. And also, I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a very important uh, uh, gesture from Iran because it is for the first time that Iran, under Ahmadinejad, under the uh, hardline government of, of, of President Ahmadinejad, for the first time have uh, signaled positively to a clear suggestion from uh, uh, 5 plus 1. Mind you, the fear that United States and 5 plus 1 and the others have always had uh, of Iran was that um, how can we be certain that you are not going to enrich beyond uh, the three percent, well, which is required for the for the for the atomic. Now, now with this proposal, if Iran handles most of its, uh, nearly all of its, uh, uh, low enriched, even if Iran wants to develop nuclear uh, nuclear uh, 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 atomic weapon, Iran cannot simply do that because Iran Haldun, what, is, what do you is make sending of what away. Sadiq is saying that uh, this is the first time Iran has signed such a deal and every time Iran shows that it's willing to cooperate, it gets knocked back by the, uh, the, the international community. What, what do you say about that? I mean, I wish Iran is, uh, is willing to cooperate like, like anybody else living in this world. We have only only one planet. We are, we are all living on the, on, the, on the same planet. But, but, but hasn't Iran shown that it is willing to cooperate by signing this deal? Can I have yes, you? I admit it's, it's a positive step forward, no doubt about that. But there are so, so many ambiguities. I mean, the declaration itself is just a repetition of Iran's official position on that. There, are, there is no concessions at all. I mean, this is not a compromise on the, on the part of Iran. We have to, I, we have I, to see that. Pa Patrick, what do you say? Surely, both in 2003 and in 2004, Iran reached agreement with the European powers on suspending its enrichment. And both times, Iran tore up those agreements and backed out of them. So there's unfortunately a history here of Iran reaching encouraging agreements that looked like good first steps and then backing out of those agreements. And it's that background which makes us concerned that that might happen again. Uh, but I quite agree that this is a, a useful first step and a good confidence building measure if Iran follows through with it. But this agreement is only an agreement in principle and there's lots more that has to be done before it can be put into effect and already voices in Iran are, are raising all kinds of doubts about whether or not this agreement will can be put into effect. But Patrick, if, if there is now a situation where uh, certain countries, um, the, the US, France for example, are still pushing for sanctions, doesn't that make them look as though they are now refusing to compromise? We've said from the beginning that at the United Nations that uh, this confidence-building measure has to be accompanied by Iranian steps to cooperate further with the International Atomic Energy Agency. And we don't see anything like that. Unfortunately, Brazil and Turkey, even though they're members of the Security Council, when they negotiate this agreement, there's no reference to the Security Council. There's no reference to Iran accepting its obligations to follow through on the Security Council orders. And 
those of us who have such great hopes for the United Nations and see the Security Council as the embodiment of international law, it's discouraging to see two members of the Security Council sign an agreement like this without any reference to what the Security Council has mandated, namely that Iran must suspend its enrichment until it shows its purely peaceful intentions. So that process of pressing Iran to show its purely peaceful intentions will continue uh, and at the same time that we have these confidence-building measures that we're talking about them. OK, well, Patrick brings up uh, the role of Brazil and Turkey, so let's have a look at them. They're both uh, non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. Both of them want a bigger international role. The question is, have they overreached themselves or been manipulated by Iran. Now, there's no doubt that Brazil's Lula da Silva and Turkey's Tayyip Erdogan have staked their reputation on Iran honoring its commitments. For Brazil, it's the first time the Latin American country has played an active diplomatic role in Middle Eastern politics. But Turkey has long cast itself in the role of mediator in the region. Now, its ties with Israel may be under threat by its intervention on Iran. Farouk Logoglu, a former Turkish ambassador to Washington, said Turkey has taken a big risk because this can turn out to be very embarrassing. Iran is a very astute player in this game. Uh, Haldan, do you agree with that assessment and do you think Turkey uh, and perhaps Brazil have been manipulated by Iran? Oh Yes, yes I do. First of all, I, uh, I have to admit that what Patrick Closen has just pointed out uh, to you know the the omission of uh, UN Security Council resolutions from the from the declaration. I, I find it's very very unfortunate because the declaration itself, the deal itself, was brokered by two members of the very very council. Uh, regarding uh, you know former uh, Ambassador Lolo's statement, that that's true. I mean, I I I, I agree with him too. I mean, Iran is, has, has proven uh, as, a, as a very astute, very, very clever player in, in international politics and, and, and regional, regional politics. Turkey is, has, has put itself in a, in a very, very delicate position between Iran and, and the rest. Until recently, it was between Iran and the West, but now, now it has changed. It is Iran and the rest of the world, the, the world world public opinion. I, I cannot see what benefit, what interest would, would, accrue, would, would, would come from this involvement by, by Turkey. Uh, Sadek, uh, if I can come to you, what, um, what do you think about that accusation that uh, Iran is playing a clever game here, that it's, uh, it's using Turkey and Brazil as a way of uh, staving off uh, the prospect of harsher sanctions? Uh, surely. I think both gentlemen, uh, Holden uh, in, in, in Istanbul and uh, Mr. Patrick Lawson uh, in, in New York, are uh, already taking a very negative attitude towards the deal. Well, they're not alone, uh, are they, Sadek? I mean, quite a few governments are taking a, quite a negative view of the deal. Yes, but yes, of, of, of course, uh, the, 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 the Iranian hardliners are playing uh, havoc with Mr. Ahmadinejad, and uh, of course, it, it is difficult. But, uh, but surely, look, uh, Patrick is saying that uh, we cannot trust Iran. Well, he's more or less saying that we cannot trust Iran, because on the record, Iran... Um, agreed to two years uranium enrichment in 2003 and what happened well what happened mr mr patrick lawson iran iran actually kept its 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 uh, its uh, promise iran actually kept its undertaking uh, under president uh, b b uh, under president khatami actually iran halted its entire uranium enrichment but, for but two years but it doesn't let now, iaea inspectors from, to visit uh, many facilities and laboratories that they want to visit it hasn't halted during, the enrichment uh, surely, of surely, its uranium no surely no surely surely during that during during uh, uh, the entire two years that Iranian enrichment was halted in Iran, dozens of times, uh, Alvarado's uh, uh, inspector uh, visited every every corner, every side, everywhere that that that, that, uh, that they wanted. But what happened was that uh, the reformist President Khatami got nothing in return. Uh, from from five plus one, and that exactly played in the hand of uh, Ahmadinejad. Now, what the West will do, what what United States will do, if they ruin 
this opportunity, this window of opportunity for, uh, for, for any reasons, uh, it, it will actually play into the hands of the hardliners in Tehran. Because they are, they are, they are more or less criticizing Ahmadinejad that why should we do that? What if Turkey backed on? What if Brazil sided with the United States? And, uh, and, uh, and this is a clear change as far as Iran's policy is concerned. Because Holden, Iran's policy was actually to develop the 20% enriched uranium inside the country. Iran's official policy was actually to buy the, 20, the, 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 uh, the, the fuel from the international market. Let, now, let me... Ahmadinejad... I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah, Saleh. I want, I want to bring Patrick in because I want to ask him, is Saleh right? Uh, this plays into the hands of the hardliners. The fact that there is now going to be a new draft sanctions resolution uh, presented against Iran, doesn't that simply, as Saleh says, play into uh, the hands of those who, who don't want to compromise in Iran? The only reason Iran agreed to the trilateral arrangement with Brazil and Turkey was because of the imminent prospect of new UN sanctions. That demonstrates that the only way that we can get Iran to move towards compromise is in fact by raising the price that Iran will have to pay unless it does compromise. So what we have seen this last week is that pressure on Iran works, that that's what achieves an agreement, that all the efforts that we had to engage with Iran and offered inducements were not successful at getting to an, uh, this encouraging agreement, incomplete though it is, and only a confidence building measure that it is, it is encouraging. And it was achieved through pressure. So the more pressure that we place on Iran, the more prospect that we will see progress on the underlying dispute, which is about uh, Iran's refusal to answer the questions from the La International last, Atomic Energy last Agency. Last quick question to uh, Haldun, because uh, I, I want to ask you, if there is another round of sanctions put on Iran now, is that a slap in the face for Prime Minister Erdogan and his efforts? Oh, ab absolutely, no, no doubt about that. I mean, after after all these efforts, if if this if this ever happens, that that would be a slap on on his face. Yes, true. Unfortunately, true. Gentlemen, it's been an interesting discussion. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, in Tehran, Sadiq Zibakalam, Istanbul, uh, Haldun Solmaz Turk, and in Washington D.C., Patrick Clawson. Now, we've had some interesting comments on previous episodes on Inside Story. Here's one response to our show on rescuing the euro. Professor Robert Soran says the average Baltic citizen has already lost most of the hopes he or she linked with the wish to join the EU and the eurozone. Many perceive the behaviour of European banks and their supportive homelands as colonialism and imperialism. Referring to our programme about the political turmoil in Thailand, B. Dougal would like to know who is funding these supposedly poor people demonstrating. Didn't this all come about after Taksin lost $1.4 billion? Why doesn't he go back to Thailand to face his court case instead of letting people fight his battle? And on the issue of sharing the Nile River, Aklilu from Ethiopia says... Ethiopia is entirely dependent on foreign aid to feed its population when there's a shortage of rain. And because of climate change, the problem will become worse. I personally believe this. Poor people should be able to take out a small share of the Nile. Well, if you have any comments to share about today's programme, then do email us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. But for the moment, from me, Shiri Ghosh, and all the team here on Inside Story, bye-bye for now.